What's up guys, Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House, and my guest today is Jeff Christian, the managing partner at CPM Group. And this was uh, this was a really interesting conversation, you know, towards like halfway through, two thirds through, I realized with Jeff, I'm not so curious about the answers to my questions as I am whether or not I'm asking the right questions. And the reason is Jeff does an excellent job, better than most, to the point that he actually has a lot of critics or haters, as he says, at cutting through all the hyperbole and sensationalism in the market, specifically in the precious metals market, but expanded into the political climate and general financial system commentary. You know, we see these headlines like, you know, collapse of this collapse of that the dollar is going to zero gold's going to a hundred thousand whatever the sensational call is you know I find the truth is usually maybe that direction but not quite maybe 60% of the way there right and Jeff does a good job at rationalizing a lot of those calls he's a silver and gold bull he's also hated on by silver and gold bulls because he's not bullish enough you know he's calling for some very dire situations in the financial system and the political environment but he's not calling for the utter collapse. And so he gets a lot of hate from the fear mongering personalities. Anyways, uh, watch this interview the whole way through. I encourage you because Jeff is brilliantly smart and I really, really enjoy this conversation. Now, as always, three things before we kick it off. There's a pinned comment beneath this video where you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter. I'd love to have you join the team. It's free, very easy to do so. Number two, uh, this YouTube channel now actually generates significant advertising revenue, which I didn't expect when I launched it, but we do now, which is great. So what I've decided to do with this cash is donate it to an organization that is very close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by giving at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to a beautiful wilderness area, provide them with supportive housing, uh, employment training, and just great influences on their life. You know, the natural world can be so transformative and therapeutic. I was a benefactor of this and I love being able to pay it forward. So Zero Ceilings, great. Check them out if you want to. And number three, if you'd prefer to listen to my content instead of watch it, you can now find me uh, wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. Okay, here's Jeff Christian. I hope you enjoy this. I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay guys, Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House and I'm joined right now finally by Jeff Christian, the managing partner at CPM Group. Jeff, it's great to finally have you on this show. You've been on my stage many times but it's great to have you here. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah we've done a lot of work in the past with Cambridge. Um, I don't think I've ever been invited to the show, but I'm here now. You're here yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's good to have you here. Thanks for making the time. There's a whole web of directions. I'd love to go with you. For anybody who's uh, a YouTube subscriber that hasn't been to one of my events or they're just not familiar with yourself or with CPM Group, can you give us the, the high level overview, Jeff? How do you spend your time? <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny because, you know, uh, I've I've worked let's say 60 to 90 hours a week for about 40 years. Uh, and um, how do I spend my time? That's what I do. Uh, CPM Group is a commodities research shop. We do fundamental research. We're independent. We don't work for companies that, well, we do work for companies that sell and market precious metals, but we're not of the ilk of companies that, produce precious metals research for marketing purposes, per se, uh, you know, with, with uh, in, uh, industry associations. So we're independent. People pay us to be right. We have a pretty good track record across commodities. I started off as a journalist. Uh, I studied journalism and international political science, especially international economics in university in the 70s. I worked as a journalist in the 70s. Uh, Jay Aaron, trading company picked me up because they had a research, a fundamental research company uh, department that produced basic data on gold and silver uh, in the 1970s at a time when Consolidated Goldfields and, and Jay Aaron shared consultants and were the two companies that produced these kinds of estimates. And Handy and Harmon and Jay Aaron produced silver. I brought platinum group metals to the operation Aaron merged into Goldman. I spun off the research department of the Commodities Research Group from Goldman Sachs in 1986 
at a time when Goldman was cutting back on its metals trading operations. And I saw an opportunity to do a sweat equity deal with them and take control of the operation. So we've been independent for about 35 years. People pay us to be right. We do basic commodities research, precious metals, manganese, specialty metals, base metals, oil and gas, agricultural commodities. Uh, we do a lot of financial engineering coming out of J. Aaron and Goldman Sachs. We were involved in gold leases from central banks in the initial stage of that. We were involved in one of the first two gold leases to a mining company uh, to finance development of a mine. We've done a lot of work on hedging and option strategies. So we do research, we do consulting. We sometimes manage assets for investors. They say that's too complex and you guys are on top of the market. So here's some money, you do it. We manage metals and commodities for our clients, for commercials, uh, producers, processors, and, and, and industrial users. Uh, we'll do hedging strategies. We'll structure hedging strategies for investors as well as commercials. Mm -hmm. uh, and doing all that work, we see a lot of companies and properties that are interesting, and we see a lot that aren't interesting. So our clients will ask us about that. And most of our business is actually with institutional investors, ranging from family offices and wealthy individuals uh, to some of the largest uh, institutional investors in the world. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, now, there's a ton there to unpack and a few things I want to, I want to pull on. <laughs> but um, before we do, I guess to my audience, the reason that I wanted Jeff on the show is because, you know, one of my core ambitions with this YouTube channel is to cut through all the hyperbole, cut through the sensationalism that dominates financial media because I'm an investor first and that stuff doesn't serve me, right? It's, it can be very misleading for retail investors like myself who have, you know, a small business to run or a nine to five and investing is not their core focus. So a reliance on finding personalities we can trust that cut through the noise, get to the signal on our behalf. And Jeff, you're one of those individuals. I mean, I think uh, I called you the perpetual voice of reason in the precious metal sector. Um, you know, and on the back of that, I know you actually received some, uh, I don't want to call it hate, but probably some, you have some critics, right? Which is funny to me because your critics are often uh, the diehard gold and silver bugs. And so you're simultaneously, I know you're right now, correct me if I'm wrong, calling for record gold and silver prices in the next four to five years. It's funny you would be at odds with a, a diehard gold and silver bug, but can you can you maybe expand on that for my audience? Why do you find yourself, if this is true, in conflict with some of these sensational gold and silver bugs in the sector? Well, first off, I'd say they're not critics, they're haters. Okay, yeah, yeah there you go. They tend to believe things rather than know things. Um, and and it's just amazing. Yeah, you're right. You know, these people act like it was somebody, you know, I gave a, one of our YouTube videos a couple of weeks ago, and I mentioned, as I often have, that we expect gold and silver prices to rise to record levels mid-decade, mid you know, 2030, 2023, 2025. And, you know, one of the nasty-ass comments at the bottom, if I may use terms like that on yeah. your show, um, was, why are you smashing down gold and silver? It's like, well, I'm not smashing it down. And yeah, you know, I'm heavily, I'm probably more heavily exposed to precious metals and commodities as a portion of my wealth than anybody, you know, that criticizes me. And right. they just get it. What they don't do is they don't look at our, our, our work. And again, we're paid to be right. So if you go back to my period of, of work at J. Aaron Goldman Sachs, it's very funny because for the vast majority of the time I was there, we had sell recommendations on precious metals. You know, I started in 1980 after the peak. Gold was coming down. Silver was coming down. Silver was a fraction of its peak by then. Gold was half of what it was. And, and we were saying, yeah, you know, we're going into a recession. Don't buy gold now. If you anything, go short. Uh, 1982 came along, the price had gotten down to $285. Silver was down at like something like four or five dollars. And we said, buy this stuff. And we issued a buy recommendation. Six months later, gold was $500. Silver was something high. And we said, okay, now sell it because we're out of that recession. Uh, and, and 
people don't like that, you know. So we've done very well, and our clients have done very well by buying when the price is low and selling when the price is high. But there are a lot of true believers out there, you know. And back then, you know, there was a, a fellow who was saying that silver was going to a hundred dollars. There are other people today who are saying silver is going to a hundred dollars. And repeatedly, what we've done is we've said no. The silver is a commodity, and there's an enormous supply of com that this commodity, both in the ground and above the ground in refined form. So when we see the price rise to fifty dollars, as we did in, in 2011, we looked at what was going on in April of 2011. We saw that almost all of the buying were the shorts on the May Comex contract buying the silver back. Uh, coin sales fell sharply because the price had gone from thirty-two dollars. To fifty dollars, mm. coin sa sale purchases by investors fell sharply. Uh, ETF holders actually were net sellers during that month. The big buying was the shorts rolling their May contracts into June. So we said, when the roll is over, the end of April, the first day, a couple of trading days of May, silver is likely to fall back to thirty six dollars. Uh, so. Don't buy now. If anything, you know, buy puts or sell your metal because you should be able to buy it back at you know a significant uh, discount to where the price is today within two weeks. Mm. And in fact, the price fell, and it went. We were wrong. It fell to thirty-two dollars or so instead of thirty-six dollars. And uh, you know, so these people who are permabulls who don't know but believe that the price is going to 100 or if you're like, you know, Mike Maloney, 1500, um, they get upset. My clients make a tremendous amount of money uh, and then they buy back. You know, and I had clients who did that and, you know, they reduced their net effective purchase price of their silver by $10, $15. I had other clients who, you know, high on vodka, uh, listening to the chatter on the internet who said no. And, you know, they bought it $50 and they're sitting on it still. Mm. Yeah. So I could see why people wouldn't like me. Well, you hit on some really important points that I want to restate. And I knowingly have some uh, really diehard uh, gold bulls that watch this show and, and silver bulls. And what I, what I want to say, I guess, at this point is, if you don't listen to the views that you uh, that offend your thesis, the only person you're hurting is yourself, right? Now, something occurs specifically in the gold and silver market, and I'm very overweight gold and silver equities. I hold physical bullion as well. I wouldn't consider myself a gold bug, uh, but it's funny how if you own a little bit, you often get labeled a gold bug. Um, you'd also have to call me a real estate bug, therefore, and maybe a cash bug and whatever else I've got in the portfolio. But Anyways, something occurs, right, where investors uh, become fans of the asset class and they fall in love with the asset class. And as soon as that happens, it's like a setup to be blindsided, right? Because you put on blinders, you follow the gurus who are, are pointing you in that direction and nowhere else. Um, and it's, it's, why do you think that occurs so frequently, Jeff, in the gold sector? Why do investors put up the blinders and follow blindly? What's so alluring and seductive about the gold sector that this occurs so much? Well, it's interesting because there has been a change in other asset markets, and I'll get to that there. But I, you know, for decades, I would say people will believe in gold and silver, and they have all kinds of myths that are just quantitatively wrong. Uh, and and people will love gold and silver, you know. And and for decades, I could say, you know, I've never met anybody who's like in love with their IBM shares or their General Motors shares, you know. And so it's something about the nature of gold and silver, and it's ta they're tangible, and you can have them, and and you know, you know, people or maybe the, your own family has survived by virtue of the fact that they had a gold coin that they could buy their way out of Hungary or Russia or or Vietnam uh, over the years. You know, so there's something tangible and and and, and visceral about gold and silver that causes people to have that. Now, one of the things that we've seen recently is that as the world's intellectual capacity has devolved, uh, you're seeing that kind of love of the assets transfer to other things. So you have true believers in Bitcoin now. You have true believers in Tesla stock. 
And you can sit there and say, okay, you know, let's look at Tesla. You know, it's got a PE ratio of 2,700. It's going to take 2,700 years for Tesla to be worth its price, right? It does not, this is not an investment. This is a, a, a casino like gamble, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm betting that there's a bigger fool than me if I'm buying Tesla stock. But you have people who are like, you know, they'll threaten your life if you point out that almost all of the profits that Tesla gets these days comes from selling environmental credits to other companies that are falling short of their environmental credit re, uh, requirements. Right. And Tesla actually loses money on every car it sells. And you say, you know, Tesla is not, you know, it's, it's just not there as a car maker and it could well disappear. And you will have that kind of visceral reaction and hatred that you see from gold bugs and silver bugs. So, you know, clearly the virus is spreading. <laughs> yeah, well, you certainly see it in, in the crypto markets. And, and again, you know, I, I, I own Bitcoin and Ethereum and I dollar cost average in and I don't really look at the price. I believe in that it's a 10 year investment and I, I don't sweat it. But uh, I understand why so many people are almost allergic to that investment because of the sentiment they see maybe on Twitter where it's like evangelical towards this asset class. And I, I, I have to sort of hold my nose and walk forward sometimes, right? But I want a horse in the race. So you do your thing. Now, so, okay, so despite all of that, you are still calling for record gold and silver prices over the next four to five years. So let's revisit that thesis then, Jeff. What's driving your bullish sentiment, and et cetera? Yeah. One of the places where we cut through the BS, if or whatever you said to describe it. You know, it, we our research is a combination of a top-down macroeconomic view of the world and regions and industries, and a microeconomic bottom-up uh, review of the markets that we follow. So for gold, we look at mine by mine, country by country, refinery, smelter, uh, jewelers. You know, we have this tremendous amount of data. If you look at our model, you know, where do we think the price of gold is going? It's a melding of that macroeconomic top down and the microeconomic industry knowledge. And most of what we see is, okay, the industry knowledge tells us that these markets are relatively tight. Gold and silver, the prices are really determined by investment demand. Investment demand got very high from 2002 to 2013 for gold, 2006 to 2013 for silver. You had an upward shift, a secular upward shift in the investment demand curve. It came down from 2014 to 2019, and now it's rising again. So the market fundamentals tell us that the markets, they're not tight. There's as much gold and plat and silver as you want right now, if you're willing to pay the price. But they have the capacity to tighten very quickly in terms of uh, current account flows, if you will, uh, going forward. But the real kicker is the macroeconomic. And we look at the state of the world and we say the state of the world is problematic. It's gotten a lot worse over the last 20 years. And um, there are going to be future recessions. There are going to be future financial, global financial crises. There's going to be financial issues. There's increased political tension, both within nations and on a global basis. And we put all that together and we say, okay, it's not going to lead to a collapse of the financial market the way the permeable <laughs> marketeers say. Right. It's not, you know, I mean, you know, I had one guy interviewing me recently and he said, you know, I've been listening to people tell me that the financial system is going to collapse for a decade. And I said, well, I'm older than you. I've been listening to it for 50 years. And, you know, the same guys and they're just not there. So we don't see the world collapsing, but we do see the scope for another recession and another financial crisis and worsening political conditions circa 2023, 2025. And when that happens, we expect investors to increase their demand for gold and silver again. And we expect the prices to rise sharply to record levels. Okay, so I want you to walk me through that because you you hit a really important point again, you know, fear sells. And, um, And it's very easy to believe this time, this time, the debt load is too much, right? This time, right? The real crash is coming. So 
<clears throat> when you talk about uh, worsening political environment, let's start with that bucket, one of the issues you mentioned. So, so I could look at that and say, yeah, I see the trajectory really since maybe 2010, when it started triggering me a little bit, you know, things like Occupy Wall Street movement, leading into more sensational presidential candidates, leading into more extremist groups, more civil unrest, all this stuff. And it's kind of a scary trajectory. And, and is that what you're pointing towards? Talk to me about that a little bit. Okay, well, let me just say, your viewers should find a copy of a movie called Why We Fight. It was produced by the Eisenhower Foundation, and it was directed and put together by Andrew Jarecki, whose father, Henry Jarecki, created Makata Metals. Uh, and it is a tremendous source of information about the uh, United States political system. It starts with Ike's farewell address, where he warns the world about the growing power of the military industrial complex and the concept of perma war. And if you go back to the late 40s, 50s, and 60s, we had a coterie of politicians in America who said, we can't afford democracy. And they've worked very hard on that basis ever since then. And they're still there. <clears throat> and it's gotten worse progressively. So toward the end of George W. Bush's administration, I asked a client of mine who was very prominent as a donor, a businessman, very big donor for Republicans, a close personal friend of a number of prominent Republicans, former secretaries uh, of, uh, of various uh, administrations, and, as well as uh, some ex-presidents. And I said, what do Republicans think about the last seven years? And he says they're astounded at how successful they've been in moving us toward the devolution of democracy. Moving us toward the evolution of democracy. Expand devolution. on that form. The, the devolution. devolution. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Getting us to the point where people will accept autocratic rule. And what you do is you undermine the uh, confidence in government leaders and other institutions. And, and, and that's been going on and it's continuing to go on. So that's a real issue. And it's causing a rise of nationalism. It's causing a rise of other problems. You know, 10 years ago, 10% of the people who bought gold and silver in North America were the guns and bunker type conspiracy theorists. Today, it's estimated that about 38% are. So you've had this virus spreading and people have become much more divisive. Now, that's happening in the United States. It's happening in Canada. To some extent. It's happening in a number of European countries. It's happening in the Soviet Union, in China. Or, I'm sorry, Russia and China. It's happening around the world. You know, the rise of national problems. But then you have the increased breakdown in international cooperation. So you have yeah. China versus the U.S., China versus Europe, U.S. Uh, versus uh, the, you know, until the new current administration, the U.S. Ver was uh, hassling Europe, it was hassling Russia. You know, you have all kinds of divisiveness. When I talk to American markets, uh, I, I will speak about the, the reduction in the U.S. government's hegemonic power. When I talk to people else are i'm sorry when i talk to u.s people i'll talk about a breakdown in international cooperation when i talk anywhere else i talk about the reduction in u.s hegemonic power and it was really disappointing to hear biden say several times including at the u.n yesterday he said oh the u.s is ready to resume its leadership role in the world well the rest of the world doesn't want us to resume our leadership role the the rest of the world wants us to re-engage as a nation among nations. Mm. Yeah. Go to the UN and talk to us as equals. Maybe you're the more powerful one. Maybe you're not as powerful as you used to be, but talk to us like adults. Don't dictate to us. Don't come into my country and say, I'm going to build a democracy like we have in the United States and then destroy the whole country. You know? So you have a breakdown on an international basis. And that's very problematic when it comes to the next recession and the next financial crisis 
and the next non-financial crisis because you don't have the willingness to cooperate among countries and governments that mirrors the willingness, the unwillingness to con cooperate at a national level in all these different countries. So we really have a situation that's extremely problematic because we're facing all of these man-made problems and we have a reduced capacity to deal with them effectively. So when you talk about the unwillingness to cooperate globally, try to draw some lines for me if you can. You know, can we say sort of East versus West? Could we more, be more granular and just say US versus China? Do you think about it like that, Jeff? Or how does it make sense in your mind and how can you explain all over it? The place. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a multivariate problem. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you an anecdote. In early 2009, the World Bank had a uh, meeting based on food crisis. Because in 2007, 2008, you may remember, there were food crises and food shortages. And there were rice riots in Thailand and other Southeast Asian countries. And Costco was limiting the amount of rice individual customers could buy in the United States. And so the, the World Bank had this meeting. And one of the things that has been happening, and it already had been happening, was Middle Eastern countries from the what we call it the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, area around the Persian Gulf and China had been buying plantations in Africa and Brazil, in other countries in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and Malaysia. And at this meeting, some the leader was talking about, well, what happens? You know, China has these vast mace uh, plantations in Zambia. What happens if there's a drought and a famine and the Zambian government says, we need to keep this maize in Zambia to feed the people. And the American, the U S executive director said, well, China will attack Zambia. And the Chinese ED said, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, first off we can't back then, 2008, China didn't even have an aircraft carrier, let alone uh, airplanes that could reach Zambia and get back, you know? So they said, no, we wouldn't do that. That's not our style. And we don't have the capacity to do it even if we wanted to. And the US ED said, so what would you do? And the Chinese ED said, we would write it off as a bad investment, right? Seems fairly logical. That's the way the world works. The US government's <laughs> first impulse is to attack and use a military solution. Other people say our first solution, our first impulse is let's get over to the UN and talk this out. So another example, just about the same time, you had the uh, chemical warfare weapons used by the Syrian government on its own population. Mm -hmm. The US's first reaction, you have to destroy your chemical weapons in six days or we're going to bomb you, right? Which is sort of like... I had a, a research assistant once who said to her boyfriend, uh, I love you madly. And if you don't in, uh, propose to me and marry me uh, within a week, I'm going to break up with you. Yeah. So we said, you got six days to get rid of it or we're going to bomb you back to the Stone Age. Russia went to China, Germany, France and the UK, went back to Syrian government and said, you got six days to avoid this. Destroy them. And they destroyed what they had at the time, cutting the legs off behind uh, underneath the U.S. government. You know, and you've seen other places, too. You know, so our first impulse is a military reaction. Everybody else's first impulse is, well, how can we deal with this together? But that was 2008. This is 2021. It's gotten so much worse. It's gotten so much worse. And we're just on the tail end, maybe on the tail end. Either way, we're going through. Uh, what you could probably point to as a massive trigger point being the global pandemic and shutdown and massive tensions just being accelerated, right? A bit of gasoline on on those fires. And, um, you know, if we're moving towards like deglobalization as a consequence, Jeff, um, you know, a common debate that I have on my channel, I'd love to ask you this, a common debate I have on my channel between my guests is who's going to own the 21st century? And that's usually on the back of United States owned the 20th century, you know, will they own the 21st century? Will China own the 21st century as the, 
the greater power. And I hear both some say, oh, well, no, US empire is still in its adolescence. And what we're seeing there is growing pains and you know they're just getting started. And others say, absolutely not, power is shifting to the East. First question for you, is that even the right question to ask? And secondly, what are your thoughts? The question belies a very simplistic view of a very complex system, which is I, the worst. I had a feeling you'd go there with it. Okay, awesome. I'll point out, you know, the Soviet uh, era, that's from 1976, the uh, Bam Troyita Lichno uh, poster from when I used to study Soviet politics. Um, mm. But um, I don't think the 21st century, it's not clear who's going to own the 21st century any more clear than it was in 1921, who would own the uh, 20th century. Uh, the U.S. has some capacities that I want to come back to, but let's first talk about China. I do a lot of work in China, and I do a lot of work with Chinese government agencies and offices, and I also studied Chinese politics since the 1970s. Um, China does not want to have its currency as the de facto reserve currency. It doesn't want to be the, the, the controller. It doesn't want to be the hegemon. It wants to be one of the largest, if not the largest, governments and economies in the world among equals. So if you talk to central bankers around the world, and I do, most central bankers see the future of a currency system as you know an ideal currency system if we can get there a multipolar currency system right now 62 percent of foreign exchange reserves held by governments are u.s dollars which means that if the governments of the world got together and said hey let's get rid of the u.s dollar they can't because there isn't uh, there aren't other things it would be hyperinflationary to say well we have to produce a whole bunch of euros and pounds and yen to have enough alternate currencies to reduce the power of the U.S. government. But right. there's another thing there, too, which is many central banks and governments <clears throat> look at the U.S. and they say the U.S. dollar could, in fact, regain its status and remain the reserve currency of choice for an indefinite period of time if the U.S. government would do the right things economically. Now, I'll, I'll get back to that. But the Chinese, I think it's very important. China doesn't want to rule the world. It wants the respect that it thinks it deserves. Uh, and it wants to be a powerful participant. And if you go and look at the United Nations or the World Bank or the IMF, China and India have been asking for a restructuring of the memberships for decades you know, we're bigger now, we're better, we've opted into the industrial revolution, we have a more important role in the world. And we would like that to be reflected at the UN and the IMF and the World Bank, um, commensurate to who we are today, as opposed to 1944, when these things were created. And the United States government has resisted that for 30, 40 years. Yeah, which doesn't help our relationships with those people. But you know, what they really want is a, thing, a peaceful type of thing. Now, you hear the U.S. say, well, you know, China's going to take over Taiwan. China's going to take over Vietnam. China's going to take over Malaysia or Burma. You know, and the Chinese government says, no, you know, when we have tried to assert our control and power in neighboring countries in the past, it's never gone well. Mm -hmm. And we really don't want to do that. So we'd like to be respected. We'd like to have our interest there. There is some revanchist view that parts of the South China Sea and the Straits of Taiwan belong to us. But let's talk about it, you know, uh, in a fair adult way. Now, going back to the dollar, there's a great time when Hillary Clinton uh, was Secretary of State. And I have to tell you, I have absolutely no respect for her. She's probably a great small town lawyer. Um, but the gold price was rising sharply. She was someplace and a reporter said, isn't the dollar de facto on a gold standard? And she said, no. If you look at the 261 million ounces that the US government has, and it does in fact have that, and you value it at today's record high prices or whatever it was at the time, you know, $1,600. <clears throat> 
it's equivalent to about one quarter of a year's deficit. So you can't do anything about the debt by saying, oh, we're, you know, the dollar, the gold price. The reporter said, so what is causing the dollar to be as strong as it is? Because, you know, I was listening to all those guys on the internet who said the dollar was going to collapse mm. for the last 30, 40 years. <clears throat> uh, what, why is the dollar so strong? And she said the dollar's strength is based on the total assets of the U.S. government, the economic capacity of the United States to make money and to make money at a far greater extent and level than other countries. We have a tremendous comparative advantages uh, across the board. And ultimately, the U.S. military. And as she said that last thing, she got that Joe Biden look on her face like, oh, I wasn't supposed to say that in public. <laughs> you know? But that's basically it. And you see that today. You know, you have two aircraft uh, task forces from the U.S. in the Chinese seas, you know, South China Sea. Yeah. Those two task forces have more firepower than the entire Chinese Navy. Yeah. People say, oh, well, yeah, but the Chinese Navy now has more destroyers uh, than the U.S. Uh, Navy. Yes, their destroyers are what they call uh, literal, literal cruisers. They can patrol the coastline of China. They can't go to sea. They can't go halfway around the world like our task forces. They now have two aircraft carriers, which they didn't have 10 years ago. So, you know, the U.S. has the capacity, if we would just get our political house in order, we have the capacity to solve our economic problems, even with an $8.4 trillion balance sheet in the Fed, and even with uh, $28 trillion worth of debt, we could turn this thing around. But we don't have the political will to do that. And that has been something that's been going on for decades, and it continues to be a problem. Yeah. There's a wonderful video that people use of Ronald Reagan from 1964 talking about how the social security system was about to collapse and run out of money. Yeah. Okay. And you hear that today. Yeah. A 1% increase in social security withholding tax and an increase from like $144,000 as your cap on social security to 250 <laughs> would give the social security system enough money to operate for the foreseeable future, which the social security system says is 67 years. They take their, they take their requirements out 67 years because that's when social security kicks in. Um, yet, since 1964, at least, you've had this constant drum beating. The social security system is going to collapse. And there's a very simple reason why. The social security system, social security funds have to be invested in U.S. Treasury or agency bonds. Banks and brokers do not get big commissions buying bonds. If you can scare the people into changing the law and allowing social security administration to invest in corporate bonds, municipal bonds, and stocks, all of those banks and brokers make gigantic commissions. Mm -hmm. And that is why you are constantly being told that the social security system is about to go bust. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw that headline two days ago talking about how the social security system is now insolvent and the recipients of this don't realize their future is uh, in such demise. So from an economic or financial perspective, it's very easy to solve. From a political problem, it's a bridge too far. Okay, got it. So let's talk about that then, because those are big numbers. You threw out 8.4 trillion balance sheet, 28 trillion in debt, accumulating something like 208 billion per month at this point. How, I mean, I know what my viewers are gonna be saying right now. They're gonna be saying, you can't turn the ship around, Jeff. Like, how do you, how do you fix that, right? There's too many zeros. Yeah. Um, if you go back, well, look at the budget, look at the debt. You know, it, that's the problem. The deficit feeds and, and explodes the debt. At the end of the quarter administration, we had less than a trillion dollars of federal debt. And federal debt as a percentage 
Federal debt as a percentage of U.S. GDP peaked in 1947 at like 43%, 143%. It fell as a percentage of GDP throughout the rest of the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s into 1981 under successive Republican and Democratic administration. Even as our debt grew to almost a trillion dollars, it fell as a percentage of GDP because the debt that we were building was used, being used to build the infrastructure that made America great and right. kept America great, right? It was, uh, it was, so you can't change it. Now, you go fast forward into the 90s, by which time uh, you had several trillion dollars worth of debt and you had a $350 trillion billion annual deficit feeding into that debt. And Clinton ran on a policy of cutting taxes. And after the election, but before his inauguration, his chief economic advisor said, it's the economy, stupid. And Clinton laughed and said, yeah, that was great. He said, no, it's the economy, stupid. You won because no one believed we were in an economic recovery because everyone's suffering financially. And you're a lose if you don't deal with the deficit, because right now you don't have the capacity to de- increase your deficit spending the next time we have a recession. So instead of cutting taxes, he increased taxes marginally, like 3% for the highest uh, wage, um, wage earners. And he started charging for services that the U.S. government provided people. You know, if you were wealthy and you had a yacht, you got free bilge cleaning and free maps and free training for your crew. And all of a sudden, the Coast Guard said, no, 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 we're going to charge you for that. And Clinton started running current account surpluses. Now, there are crazy people running around the gold market who will spend all of their lives trying to tell you how that's bullshit. Uh, But the reality is that's what happened. And they actually reduced the deficit by the debt by a trillion dollars. And they had four years of surpluses. And during that time, the late 1990s, the dollar skyrocketed. We still had massive debt. We still had all kinds of economic issues. Mm -hmm. But people saw the ability of the U.S. government with smart actuarialists to figure out how much you can tax people before they complain. Mm. And I remember people at the People's Bank of China looking at what was going on in the U.S. saying, that's what we need. We need an economy that is so strong and diverse, which is one of the strategic advantages that the U.S. has, with natural resources and intellectual resources and the superiority in, in, in primary research uh, and, and patents um, and a variety of other issues. We need that so that we can protect our domestic economy from future financial crises. Mm. And that actually is the definition of what central banks are supposed to do. They're supposed to protect their domestic economies from external shocks and internal shocks, right? So we had that, and then we just threw it all away. Now we've got $28 trillion in debt. We've got massive deficits, uh, and it would be possible to fix this. I wrote a piece back during the Occupy Wall Street days called Five Easy Pieces. And it was five policies that could be changed that would have a marginal negative impact on 1% of the population and a no negative impact on the other 99%, but could restore the country to a surplus, uh, a budget mm-hmm. surplus. Yeah. It's probably harder now but you can probably look at those five things and a few other things and, and get back there. And unfortunately, we just, we just lost one. I mean, one of the things that caused the deficits to boom, uh, explode under George W. Bush was he expanded Medicare to pharmaceuticals. And he did not fund that in any way. You know, under Clinton, they agreed to what they called pay go, pay as you go. If you're going to have a new $300 billion per year program, like expanding Medicare to cover pharmaceuticals, then you have to come up with $300 billion of expenses. Bush got rid of that. He said, I'm just going to do this. It's going to be another $300 billion. But as Vice President Cheney says, deficits don't matter anymore. 
And he agreed that the government may not negotiate discounts on pharmaceuticals. Right. Okay. When Obama came in and tried to do the Affordable Care Act, he found the only way he could do it was to maintain that. The government may not negotiate discounts the way insurance companies do, the way other countries do with American pharmaceutical companies. Hmm. Last week, eight Republic, a Democratic Congress people voted with the Republicans to kill a provision in the current leg uh, financial legislation that would have allowed Medicare to negotiate discounts on its pharmaceuticals. Okay. That would shave about $500 billion off of our annual deficits. Wow. That one act. Right. Yeah. So you can go through the budget. You know, it's like, again, it's like the simplistic thing. Oh, my God. What are we going to do with, you know, two trillion, three trillion, four trillion dollar deficits and twenty eight trillion dollars worth of debt? You can look at it in a simplistic fashion and say that's got to crash. Or you can look at it in all of its complexity, roll up your sleeves and start saying, what can we do? Where can we cut this? We can cut four billion, four hundred billion dollars out of debt, out of defense, and still have the largest defense budget in the world. We can cut four hundred, five hundred billion dollars out of pharmaceutical costs by changing that system. We can make the social security system solvent by increasing the withholding tax by one percent. We can generate something like five hundred or more billion dollars a year by increasing the marginal tax rate three percent. Not by going back to the 61% that was powerful between Kennedy and Reagan. Yeah. Not going back to the 91% that Truman and Eisenhower had <clears throat> for a marginal tax rate. Just going to like 41% on the top 1% generates like four or five hundred billion dollars. You put those three things together and you've got a big chunk of the deficit gone. Okay, so then the million dollar question is like, can we get to a, a place politically where we're able to tackle these? Because the way you outline it, I can wrap my mind around it. I'm like, yeah, exactly. Half a trillion in pharmaceuticals, half a trillion in defense cuts, uh, half a trillion in a 3% uh, tax increase in the top 1%. It, it sounds easy, Jeff, but you know, as you know, like, so what's what's the realistic approach here? And do you see this uh, result? Well, that's the problem. You know, I have a chart that I use in presentations where I talk about the lack of political will. And I mentioned it earlier. Truman and Eisenhower had a 91% marginal tax rate. Yeah, you know, it's just totally mind-blowing. Yeah. You know, uh, you're a wealthy person in 1950, you're earning hundred thousand dollars and you're paying ninety thousand dollars in taxes. Crazy. Yeah. And you're still really well off because you've got ten thousand dollars after taxes. Sure. You know, the politicians had the political will to say this is what we need to do to reduce our debt to GDP ratio and to keep America strong. And the people in the country had the political willpower to vote for those politicians. <clears throat> All gone now. And can it come back? It can come back. I, you know, I'm not a, <laughs> I studied, I've studied Chinese politics. I've studied Soviet politics. Uh, I've studied African politics. Uh, U.S. politics are something beyond my, my scope of understanding. You know, I don't know if we can, but, you know, I don't see the political leaders uh, capable of restoring the sense of community that's required to have that done. You know, most of the political leaders I see on both sides of the uh, fence speak in divisive terms, bipolar, it's us versus them, it's this versus that. Always. Uh, I, I see very few people who say, you know, let's try to get together and talk this through. Yeah, interesting. And one last thing, that's true on a national level, and it's true on an international level. Oh, and on a human level, I mean, you know, doing the hard thing, the means to an end is, is always a tough choice, right? And uh, what's this quote? Your, your life is often defined by the number of uncomfortable conversations you're, 
you have, you're willing to have, right? And how true is that? Like how many rocks do we just keep in the backpack that we don't want to deal with? So we carry them around and they weigh us down, right? And when you're comfortable confronting those things and doing the hard things and the work, et cetera, uh, that's progress, right? Easier said than done. Okay. Look, um, I've blown through my time with you. I'm really glad that we did this. I feel uh, as though so frequently I have a guest on the show and I'm asking questions because I'm curious about the answer. As we progressed through this conversation, I found more that I was wondering if my questions were right. And, and that's just so awesome. Such a great experience as a host because uh, uh, I, I just loved it. So anyways, thanks so much for your time, Jeff. I really appreciate you coming on. I'm glad that you invited me and invite me back anytime you want to continue the conversation. Okay, guys, three last things. First, if you enjoy my interviews and would like a bit more, you can subscribe to my Friday newsletter. It's free and the comment to subscribe is right beneath this video in that pinned comment. In this newsletter, I share my key lessons learned, takeaways, and any actions that I might be taking in the market as a consequence of what I've learned on the show. Second, when I started a YouTube channel, I never anticipated generating any advertising revenue. But coincidentally, I do now, which is awesome. And so what I've decided to do is donate this to an organization that is very close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Their mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by providing young people experiencing homelessness with supportive housing, employment, professional support, life skills, and outdoor adventure. Because often young people in urban centers with no resources will never get the opportunity to experience wild places, nature that can be so transformational and absolutely was for me. Third, if you prefer to listen to my content, you can now find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show.